In this video, let's take a look at the difference between two types of buffers which were introduced as part of the Basel III Accord. And these buffers are number one, the capital conservation buffer and number two, the countercyclical buffer. So let's start with the capital conservation buffer and let's talk about why do we need this type of buffer. Well, one has to acknowledge that the regulator specified minimum values, let's say for a capital ratio or for that matter a type of capital, these regulator specified values are in fact minimums. So banks, they have to target to maintain capital that is in excess that means over and above the regulator specified minimum values. Supervisors, they are required to step in on a very timely basis if they observe that the capital ratios of any given bank are falling and nearing the minimum levels which the regulator has specified. Okay. Also, the motivation behind the capital conservation buffer is to ensure that banks, they build up buffers or let's say build up surpluses of capital during normal or let's say non-stressed times so that they are in a better position to handle any sort of losses that happen in later periods. And in doing so, they are able to avoid any breaches with respect to the minimum levels which the regulator has specified. Okay, What is the size of the capital conservation buffer? Well, it's set to be equal to 2.5% of the bank's risk-weighted assets. How is this requirement met? This requirement for the capital conservation buffer is met by holding additional core equity tier 1 capital. Without the CCB requirement, we know this that the core equity tier 1 capital of a firm should be at least 4.5% of risk weighted assets. The total tier 1 should be at least 6% of risk weighted assets and the total capital should be at least 8% of risk weighted assets. If I were to bring in this new requirement, this additional requirement, the minimum levels of these ratios respectively becomes 7%, 8.5% and 10.5%. Okay. Now what happens if you as a bank is found to be non-compliant with respect to the capital conservation buffer requirement? Well, what will happen is that your earnings distributions, your discretionary distributions of earnings will be restrained. That means there will be restraints imposed on your dividend payouts, on your share buybacks and even on the discretionary bonuses which you pay to your staff. Okay, And these restraints, they will persist till you are able to conserve enough capital to bring your core equity tier 1 ratio up and above 7%, the minimum. Okay, So therefore, any risk with respect to non-compliance, you know, with respect to the capital conservation buffer, eventually therefore is borne by the shareholders of the firm because they get impacted if non-compliance happens. Okay, Then, let's talk about the second type of buffer which is the countercyclical buffer. This buffer is meant to be complementary to the capital conservation buffer. If the capital conservation buffer focused on individual banks and tried to reduce the likelihood that any individual bank, its capital ratios fall below the regulator specified minimums, when it comes to the countercyclical buffer, the focus is broader. The focus is on system-wide risks. Countercyclical buffer is meant to handle system-wide risks from banks' macroeconomic environment. It is introduced to protect the entire banking system during economic downturns. Okay, it's introduced 
to kind of lessen the impact which let's say cyclical economic activity might have on the banking system as a whole. The focus stays the same and the focus is to plan ahead for any kind of future losses. Okay, let's do this. Let's try and dig a bit deeper into the impact of the cyclical economic activity on the entire banking sector and how counter cyclical buffer can come in and help. So let's say I were to plot my economic activity over time. So this is the kind of graph that I'll observe. So this graph is showing me some kind of a cyclical behavior. During this period, which is like an expansionary or let's say normal period, banks collectively speaking would observe an accelerated growth in the credit that they extend to borrowers. Okay, And this happens because during this period, the credit risk management systems of all these banks, they kind of under assess the risk of lending to potential borrowers. Okay, So, during this period, the credit risk management systems, they kind of spit out probabilities of default which are lower than long term averages and that's what accelerates this credit growth. Okay, So, during this period, because risk is under assessed, banks, they build up insufficient levels of reserves which are meant to let's say absorb any expected losses and also insufficient levels of capital which are which are which is required to absorb any unexpected losses okay so reserves and capital they are under assessed during this period when the time and the tide actually turns and you enter a recessionary phase Banks, collectively speaking again, they find that their risk assessments go up. Now, the probabilities of default which the systems are spitting out, that probability of default is higher than long term averages. Okay, So, during this phase, banks, they start to recognize higher levels of losses and collectively all banks, they slam breaks on any kind of lending. So, credit supply in the entire economy comes down. Okay, Because banks are now reeling under excessive losses for which they have insufficient reserves and capital, all banks they now want to raise more capital and during this period capital now comes at a high cost. Okay, Now, where does the counter cyclical buffer come in? Let's say if the supervisor for this particular region, this particular jurisdiction were to apply a counter cyclical buffer requirement during this period, a requirement let's say which progressively builds up from 0% to the maximum level of 2.5%. Then during this time, banks they will now be forced to raise and maintain extra level of capital. Okay, but it's not really that big a problem because during this period capital is abundantly available and that too at a low cost. So if a surplus has been generated during this period, finally when I enter this recessionary period, because I have a surplus already generated, I as a bank or let's say let's talk about the entire banking system can stay healthy during this period and continue to lend. So funds, they continue to flow throughout the entire economy and banks, they do not slam brakes on any sort of credit generation. So overall, counter cyclical buffer, a requirement which increases during this period and finally gets relaxed during this period, helps to reduce the amplitude of the credit cycle and also it helps to raise funding, it helps to raise capital at a time when it is cheaply available to ensure financial stability during a time when capital is scarce. Okay, This is about the motivation behind the counter-cyclical buffer.
Finally, and very quickly, let's take a look at how much of the countercyclical buffer is required. Well, it's a number which can be between 0 and 2.5%. A number which is set as per supervisory discretion. It's not the case that all banks in the economy are subject to the same requirement. Countercyclical buffer can be bank specific. It is set in multiples of 0.25%. If there is a bank which is internationally active, then the countercyclical buffer that it will be subject to would be a weighted average of the countercyclical buffers which apply to all the different regions, all the different markets in which that bank operates. As was the case with the capital conservation buffer, countercyclical buffer requirement is also met using core equity tier 1 capital. So if I were to simultaneously apply both the capital conservation buffer and also the counter cyclical buffer in full force that means the full two and a half percent the minimum ratios become nine and a half percent for core equity tier one eleven percent for total tier one and thirteen percent for total capital okay again as we had in the case of capital conservation buffer any sort of non-compliance with respect to counter cyclical buffer would invite restrictions on the distributions of earnings and you will be forced to raise more capital. Okay, so this video was about understanding the motivations behind the capital conservation buffer and the counter cyclical buffer. Understand how much of these buffers is imposed on individual banks, how these requirements are to be met, and what happens in the event of non compliance with respect to any of these two requirements. Okay?